This is the Sony F55 camera build. So the Sony F55 comes in two cases. One is the main body case, and the second is just for power. So it has the power supply and the battery charger and three V-mount batteries. The Sony F55 uh, has, uh, has the handle already attached to the top. The, most of the body parts here are all on there. We see that there is a PL mount adapter in the front, and the bottom has a rail system, and uh, is already attached to the camera. We can leave this built. It fits in the case just as it is. So um, attaching the tripod release plate, I'm using the Sockler DV18 uh, tripod right now, but I, I could also use the DV12. I want you to note that the attachment portion here um, could be anywhere along the camera body. This really depends on how, um, how your camera is weighted. So. We definitely, as you can see by the scratch marks here, uh, we definitely want to put this at the front of that um, base plate because the lenses that we're going to put on this camera that we have paired with it are very heavy. So the front end is going to get really heavy. So we're going to attach that quick release plate from the Sockler tripod on there. I need to find my fat screwdriver. So we want to make sure and use a screwdriver that has a really fat blade to it. Uh, because the screw itself on the F or on the on this plate here is fat as well. So I'm using a T-handled Swiss tools short fatty, but a nickel works nice as well. So I want to make sure that that's nice and tight so that we don't lose the camera. Uh, right now, we click that into place. There we go. So I may need to release this again uh, to actually tighten the rails because you can see that these uh, wing nuts don't actually ratchet. So I may need to pull the camera off again when I put the focus rails on here, the accessory rails onto the camera. So the next item that I'm going to add to this, I should maybe just make the rails to begin with. In our Sony F55 kit, I have a couple of carbon fiber uh, rails. So I'm just gonna slip those into the, into the mount. There we go. Uh, so I'm able to tighten the back one at least. There we go, so it doesn't slip out. And then to release the tripod here, I pull the plunger down, swipe across. Make sure you got a hand on this camera though so it doesn't go flying off the tripod. I'm going to pull that across there and then gently lift up on the camera. And now this is ready to receive that release plate again. Um, so as soon as I press down on this little dimple right there, bam, it's going to smash that in and uh, connect with that. So I want to finish tightening up the rails here and make sure that those, because again, these wing nuts are not the ratchet type that we saw on some of the other accessories or that you might have seen on other accessories. So right now, I would typically put a viewfinder, like a traditional camera viewfinder here, but right now this kit is lacking that uh, accessory. So we're gonna use an external monitor. So I've got a Shogun uh, Atomos monitor here that I'm going to attach, and I can attach this from any of the mounting points. Um, I mean, typically I would want to do it so that the letters are correct, but it's okay to mount it upside down. It has a function in the menu for you to hang it or um, flip that screen around any which way you want. All right, so uh, there we go. We've got a lot of different outputs on the back of this here but I want your inputs and outputs. So it has four different inputs and an output and a sync function. Um, so the last input right here, the last input is the one you want to use. Now there's a slot, two slots here for batteries and a slot here for a media card. We're not going to use those because we're going to use the power from the camera's battery itself. And uh, we don't need to record this because we're recording with the camera's internal media cards instead. Uh, so just remember, it's the last input. That's what you want. If you are going out to another device, that would be the output for it. Uh, and then over here is the power supply. So that's where the power is going to get plugged in. And here's our on-off switch right there. So I could use any mount that I want here on the top plate. 
whatever is going to be convenient for your operator. I'm just going to choose any spot, whatever might be convenient to me as an operator. City arms take a little bit of getting used to. They can flip around and go different directions. Um, and they're, they're sort of floppy as you're making those adjustments. All right, I need to connect those cables uh, to that monitor. So I'm going to find the appropriate cables. I've got two cables in here. One is a short BNC cable. So this would be uh, how I attach the monitor to the camera. So I've done it to the input there, the last one, as I said, and then here's the power supply. Now, if we come around to this side of the camera, this is the, uh, this is the options part here. I don't have my battery hooked up yet, so I can't attach the camera to the camera system yet. But we have lots of different SDI outs right here. So along this path, I have SDI out from the mains, one and two, and I have SDI out three and four from the subs. Now this is gonna be very important later on when we actually are setting our LUT for this camera. So the LUT or lookup table may be applied to the subs so that we look at a normal image, but if I'm recording in S-Log3, that wouldn't be applied to the mains and the internal recording. So I wanna make sure, if I wanna see what this looks like on the monitor as S-Log, I would plug into inputs one and two. If I wanted to see what the LUT looks like and have the monitor set to uh, Rec. 709 or pass-through mode, then I would set this to subs three or four. Same thing when I'm uh, uh, connecting the monitor on set, if I want to see it with the LUT and I have the LUT turned on for the subs, I would output from in output three or four. If the monitor, like the Sony 17-inch monitor, has a LUT built in for Rec. 709 from S-Log, I could attach that to the mains. And if I am recording with a LUT, then of course I could go out of any of these outputs and it would look normal. So let me attach a battery here from the battery stash. These are the Anton Bauer Cine 150s and it shows you a percentage on the display here how much of that power is left. Um, and so these are going to drain a lot faster perhaps than, uh, than they charge up. So make sure that you're on top of watching how much uh, battery you have. And then it's good to let batteries rest for 10 or 15 minutes or so um, at least before charging them again. Um, we've got some time code features here. We don't need to worry about that right now as our um, audio recorders um, aren't necessarily set up for syncing that. Um, and then audio inputs right down here. Okay, so uh, I would connect my monitor to the DTAP right here on the back side. So now my monitor is capable of getting some power from the camera. We rotate back around to this side. Uh, our accessories are pretty minimal here. We've got a follow focus for this. Uh, again, I'm taking this wheel and attaching it to the follow focus. I want to make sure that those that keyway matches up and that um, if I need to adjust the spacing on that, I want to make sure that that is flush and touching and then I can there we go, and now I can tighten that. And my lever here uh, and focus gear brought into play. So this should slide right on to the front mechanism. There we go. And so I'll just kind of wait there uh, and see where my lens lands for that. I'm gonna tilt this back a little bit so that the lens isn't falling forward necessarily when I'm mounting a lens onto the camera. So the set of lenses that we have paired with the Sony, um, we had retired the uh, Red One uh, camera and uh, added the Sony F55 to the um, collection of cameras, but we still had the Red Pro Primes that we had paired with that. So the Red Pro Primes, and we have six lenses in that set ranging from 18 to 100 millimeters. And each one of these is a PL mount lens, so that'll work with any of our PL mount cinema cameras, and the image will cover 4K. Um, there's that. 
Now, red doesn't make lenses anymore. They only made it for a short amount of time. But each one of these lenses weighs about seven pounds. So it's quite substantial. The PL mount lens. Um, so the Sony uh, F55 comes with its own FZ mount, which is the silver uh, knobs back here. And basically, I'm taking this off right now just so that you can see that I never need to change this, right? This shouldn't come off for any reason. None of the lenses we have would actually fit on there. And I'm not sure that Sony really made any. It's just a mount that's meant to be adjustable. So, but it has the same sort of locking measures as a PL mount. There's some electronic connectors in there for smart lenses, but uh, we don't need to worry about that. So the PL mount is a, a, about an eighth to quarter turn there to the left, and this cap will come out of place. There is a keyway right at the top there. That's what I'm looking to match up. It's up here at about the two o'clock position. And so the lens has those and so does the cap. So that's, and then a, a nice, a quarter turn clockwise and that's tightened into place, positive lock. So again, uh, I don't wanna put any canned air or any fingers or anything inside of that area. And when I'm changing lenses, I wanna make sure that that time is as short as possible. So a lens should be standing by. We don't wanna leave the camera's body cavity open for any lengths of time and make sure that whoever takes this lens uh, body cap off doesn't take it home with them for the night. All right, so I'm gonna grab a lens here. Oof, I forget how heavy these are. Uh, and typically an AC is gonna set the focus to infinity and the uh, iris to wide open, in this case a 1.8. And we're gonna put that witness mark, the mark that is showing me what the focus and f-stop are over to the operator side. Now the lens itself has in its cloverleaf pattern here, it has a keyway on all four sides, which means I could mount this lens four different ways. But the only right way is for me to put uh, so that those markings are there. Now you might find that it's a little bit stiff on this particular camera uh, compared to maybe the red or an airy. Um, and so we wanna make sure that that positive lock that the mechanism actually slides over and locks that into place. Before you let your hand go here, um, assuming that you've locked it in place only to have it um, be slightly in front of there. So make sure that it is actually fixed on the mount before letting go. All right, now I can actually uh, adjust the focus, follow focus here and put that and attach it to its gears, sliding forward, maybe back just a little bit, tighten into place, tighten the gear onto the lens, and now I'm able to adjust the focus with my follow focus. There we go. So either the operator or the camera assistant is going to be adjusting that focus. Uh, so if I did want to use the map box with these, there is a large uh, map box here of, with 4x4 and 4x5.65 filters, um, as well as a, a sort of fabric donut here that comes with to protect the lens from any accidental uh, shade. So it's two parts. Um, it actually has a bracket that you remove so that you can slide the map box on after the lens has been installed. But first, we have to actually install this bracket in front of uh, the follow focus. So we'd need to remove the follow focus before we put this map box on. I did it wrong. So with this bracket, it sort of looks like they're both the same, but one side is a little bit longer than the other side. So we want to make sure that the longer side is on the bottom and then uh, rough that into place. We'll see if we got enough rails here and all kinds of other stuff going on. So our follow focus is going to be pretty tight. I may need to adjust the gear here so that it's riding on the back side rather than the front. It's basically just a thumb screw. And that gear will slide off and I'll be able to place that gear on the back side. That gives me a little more distance here so that my follow focus is hanging out at the end of the rails and I'm still able to reach the gear mechanism there. 
All right, now I should be able to slide this rail contraption together. There we go, tighten that into place. Now, if I lift up on the top corner here, uh, top corner, if I lift up on this, it's actually a swing away map box. The great thing about this, uh, is that I'm able to actually change the lens and leave the whole map box contraption on. Whereas some other map box designs, I have to remove the map box, change the lens, put the map box back on. This little uh, skirt there will fit into place as we uh, bring the lens, swing the map box around. You want to make sure that that piece of fabric doesn't end up in front of the lens though and give you some extra vignetting. So we'll tighten that over the there. All right, now I've got my map box in play. Same thing as I had on some of the other map boxes. I have a flag for the top or an eyebrow for the top. And we'll tighten that into place. There we go, loosening the screws. Make sure you don't lose these little uh, screws here. It looks like we have an odd set but I want to make sure that that lens isn't catching any of the flare from the light that I'm using for this demo. There are a couple of hand grips in the kit. I could attach those to the rails uh, in a way to create sort of a handheld camera. Um, there is a polarizer filter in the kit. I would add that to these map boxes right there. Um, I need some media. And so the uh, F55 uses S by S S by S cards, and so each one of these is 128 gigabytes, and those I could load up both into the into the camera right here, and I always do it wrong, just like USB, it's always wrong first, and so the label is going towards the back, and then that shuts. All right, if I want to eject the media, I press in on the button first, and then press again, and it will push out the media just far enough for me to retrieve it. Input, locks into place, close the door, out, press once, press twice to eject and slide out. Again, keep the dust out of there and close it up. There is a case that comes with each one of these. There's also a card reader and cable inside the case here as well. So right now I'm checking the balance. Um, it looks like we're definitely pretty front heavy here. So I'm gonna use that mechanism. It's right over on this side. I'm not sure that we can see it right now. Underneath the front of the tripod. And what that will allow me to do, I flip that lever over and now the base of the tripod where the quick release plate is attached actually slides back. And so gently, again, keeping a hand on it, I brought it back now to around a four. The middle point of the weight of this camera right now, because this lens is so heavy and we've got a map box and follow focus, we've got a battery on the back end, which adds to some of that, and the monitor's kind of hanging out in the middle. But the fulcrum of this camera system right now is about right here. So that's where we're placing uh, this line uh, on there so that we're not fighting the tripod. So I'm going to lock that back into place so it doesn't continue to slide after I begin operating. All right, so now I'm not fighting with the camera. It's not trying to take a dive. It's not trying to reach for the sky, uh, but it's pretty well balanced. But I still want to make sure and lock that mechanism before stepping away from the camera. So now that I've got the camera totally built, uh, I'm ready to turn it on. I've turned on my monitor. Um, flip the switch for the power and the camera begins to boot up. All right, uh, one of the first things you might see is please execute APR. And APR is a sensor balancing mode, a black balance. And so if you can get to a lens cap quick enough, uh, in this case, uh, it disappeared on us and has um, continued that. Not to worry, I would just, the next time you power down and power up, if it has APR available, you would press OK, as long as you have a lens cap blocking it. So that's OK. Right now I have, uh, I see an image on the monitor, but much of the menu functionality is also available here on the side screen on the operator's panel. Working with the F55 menus, right now I have the display turned on for the monitor. And depending on what settings you have in the menu, I have it set up for 
a user button. There's three user buttons here and a fourth user button hidden right over underneath the panel. And I have that in a display mode that allows me to remove the display or show the display. Now when I press the menu button down here, um, and then I have a menu wheel and the cancel back button. So as I open up this menu, I have a user menu, which is the shortcuts to most of the things that you're going to want to have access to. So if I push in on that select button right there, the selecting wheel, um, I see that the system frequency is 23.98. Frequency means frames per second in Sony. Uh, a base setting. Uh, so right now I have this in shooting mode Cine EI, so that means uh, a cinematic exposure index. And then the main operation, we're going to leave that at YPBRPP. Okay, great. And then color space, we want to make sure that when we select that, we are shooting the S Gamut 3 Cine S Log 3. And that takes our color space and makes it uh, and, and aligns it better with the RGB color space of Rec. 709. The imager scan mode, this is a cool feature that the Sony F55 will allow me to do. If I want to scan the whole sensor, it would be in normal mode. But if for some reason I wanted to do a 2K full or 2K center, I could do that. So recording in 2K, um, I could use the whole sensor or I could crop in and use a smaller portion of it, roughly equal to about Super 16. This would allow me to use different lenses. So if I had smaller lenses or lenses that were appropriate for a smaller imager, I could use the 2K center mode. But for right now, I'm in 4K and also uh, shooting the full sensor. Record format, this is where all of the options are. And I see right now that I've selected S by S format XAVC 4K class 300. Now class 300 is a very high quality for 4K. That allows me to shoot up to 60 frames per second in 4K and up to 180 frames per second in 2K. But if I change that to XAVC Class 480, uh, this is an even higher quality 4K, but it limits me to 30 frames per second at 4K. Um, QFHD uh, is the HD standard for television sets, so that would be... Um, it's still a 2160 image, but it's formatted for 16 by 9, whereas the 4K is a cinematic or 1.9 to 1 aspect ratio, so a little bit more widescreen. Same thing down here. I've got XAVC 1920 by 1080 or the 2048, so a little more cinematic widescreen on those options. So those are the options that I would choose from. In general, we're probably at class 300. I'm going to get a little more data out of each card and I can change that record format, execute. All right, now that's done. So back in the menu, uh, cancel back to get out of that setting. Output format, so I can leave that alone for now. Monitor LUT, this is an important menu because I see that I have main and internal LUT turned off. So again, to look at the S S-log footage that this camera is recording, I definitely maybe want to have a LUT turn, per, turned on. I definitely want to have a LUT turned on so that I'm not looking at a gray, washed out, um, low contrast image. So right now I have three different options. I can choose a LUT uh, look profile or a 3D LUT. Um, so if I load in a LUT or a 3D LUT, I would have to load that into the camera. And there is a SD card slot right below uh, where the S by S's go in. So I could actually load up a LUT onto an SD card and then go through the menu and, and, and add that to the camera. Uh, I don't know what's loaded in here right now. Uh, so I'm going to use one of the Sony defaults, uh, which is look profile. And if I select that, um, I can come down here and choose one of the four options. In general, a low contrast 709, type A 709 low contrast, S-Log2, which in general we're not shooting, or a more cinematic 709, which is a little contrast here. So in general, if I shot this, it wouldn't look horrible, uh, and that would be just fine. Uh, SDI main and internal record. So this is what I was talking about when I'm outputting uh, the signal from the main outputs, uh, the outputs one and two on the SDI cable, 
if I have that turned off, which is what I want, because that's also what's being recorded to the S by S card. So I want to make sure that's turned off. Now the subs, I can turn that on so that I can see it on my monitor, or I can see it on the uh, monitor that I have set up for the rest of the, for the director to see uh, and to judge lighting. Uh, right now we don't have a viewfinder connected, but I could also have that see the LUT as well. Clip naming, this is mostly how you want clips named or numbered. Um, other viewfinder settings. Here I have the assignable buttons set up so that button number one is for peaking. Button number two is going to go into slow and quick, which is the slow motion menu uh, for the Sony F55. Number three is the video signal, meaning that's how I can bring up that waveform monitor or make it go away. And finally, button number four is the waveform. Uh, I'm back there. Oh, that, I wanted to show you one more thing here, and that is format media. So when I have the media installed in there, I press media, I press which one I want to format, and choose execute, and it really wants to make sure that I'm sure about that. I want to make sure and format my media before any filming begins. Um, that makes sure that you have a fresh slate to work with. All right, some of the other menu items. Now I'm going to get out of there and go to menu. All right, so now my screen is clear there. Many of the other settings, though, are available on the camera body itself. So if I have a color temperature that I want to work with, if I press this button, I can scroll through the presets. So S-Log3 only allows me to record in 3200, 4300, or 5600. I have no other options. It's much like film used to be. So if I'm primarily in an office building, it's probably 4300. If I'm using tungsten instruments, it's probably 3200. And if I'm outside or using daylight lights uh, like HMIs, I would be in 5600. Um, down here it shows that I have the LUT, so it is accessible there as well. So I can see that I can, I'm in my look profile right now. Um, I can adjust the exposure index of the camera. The native exposure index for the Sony F55 is 1250, so generally I want to leave it there. Uh, if I'm, and this goes against your uh, instincts, but if I'm shooting outside in a bright condition, I might want to increase that exposure index because it'll give me more stops of overexposure um, latitude. So it goes against what we think though. If I want to have more underexposure latitude, I might bring this down to 800, which would be similar to the red cameras, but I would also get less overexposure latitude and more underexposure latitude, meaning I'd be able to dig into those dark shadows a little bit more. But 1250 is normal for this camera. Um, the shutter, I can adjust the angle of that. I could go into the menu and change that to a speed as well. 180 is normal for 24 frames per second. And here I can change the frames per second. In this case, I could adjust it to do a slow and quick 4K, somewhere between 1 and 60 frames per second. Right now, somebody has it set up in the menu for 12 frames per second, meaning they were doing some fast motion or something like that. So now, if I press the button for slow and quick, um, nope, that makes it go back to normal. So same thing as this button here. Um, if I choose 4K and now roll through that, all right. Now, at one frame per second, I have to engage it, I guess. There we go. So at one frame per second, the exposure is going to be very bright. Um, and at 180 degree shutter, that would be the normal look for that. So I might need to adjust the shutter to compensate for the light or my f-stop. This would be like shooting time lapse, but with re a regular slow motion mode. And then again, it can go from uh, 1 all the way to 60 and all the numbers in between. Here we go. So now we're at 60 frames per second. Again, that brought down the light, so I'm going to need some more light for this slow motion effect. If I go back to there, it's going to go back to the fixed 24 frames per second. And there we go. So as we toggle on this over here, we've got some buttons for paging through. Um, right now we're in the camera menu, but if we flip over to the file menu, it would allow me to see the files. We haven't recorded anything yet. 
Um, here is some audio menu and some levels for that. And then I've got, it turns it into a player, so I can do playback mode um, if I want to see a clip that I've actually recorded. So again, these six buttons here uh, are controlled by this paging mechanism there. Uh, once I press record, there we go, it's showing me that I'm recording, time code is rolling, and everything is working out just great. Now when I stop that, if I go to view, go to view, and I should be able to play that. This is not a touch screen. These six buttons are activated by the menus that are appropriate to them. Status will show me a different display. Here in this case, it's bringing up my audio menu. That's great. Brightness um, will change the brightness of this screen depending on situations I'm in. Um, there's some other options for this as well, formatting, my S by S, some other menus and things like that. Again, the general menu is available here, but it should also be showing on my screen. I would have to go into displays and change that if for some reason it's not there. Um, up here at the front, one of the great features about this that you won't find on a RED camera um, is an ND filter wheel. So I have clear, I just gently pull that out slightly and click over, and it actually changes the wheel over uh, to a 1.8 ND and a 0.9 ND and back to clear. So we have 0.9 is three stops and 1.8 uh, would be six stops of control. So depending on how bright your situation is, I should be able to take care of the light with those two things in combination with the f-stop and the lighting. To eject the media, as long as it's not recording, I can pull that media out at any time. There's no eject in the menu system. Just make sure that it's not red uh, recording. So I can pull that media out at any time, no problem. Um, power down the camera, simple as that. Um, I do recommend powering down before changing the battery. It'll probably give you a low voltage warning and saying, hey, you need to change the battery. Make sure you do that. Um, the, the release for that battery is right there. Again, just V-mount system. Don't forget to detach your, your monitor cable there uh, before heading away.